Welcome, Dale Tuggy, to Restitutio. So glad to have you in conversation today. Thanks for having me, Sean. It's a pleasure. Uh, today we're talking about the debate you recently did with William Lane Craig. Uh, just to get started, how did you get a debate with William Lane Craig? How did that come well, about? Yeah, I was invited by this uh, young fellow, Jordan Hampton, who runs this really good analytic theology YouTube channel called The Analytic Christian. And uh, I recommend checking that out if you're not afraid of adding a little bit of analytic philosophy into your theologizing. I think he does a good job with it. I think he keeps the emphasis on the issues and the arguments rather than the personalities, as so many lesser apologists do. And uh, in particular, he has a playlist where you can hear some of the rival Trinity theories by people like Mike Ray. Um, so yeah, you should check that out. Um, it's not just about Trinity, obviously. It's about the whole range of theological thinking, you know, things like omniscience and omnipotence and divine timelessness or God being in time and things like that. So there's a lot of strong material there. So I, I was delighted. I knew he would do a good job uh, being the referee. Um, and he also, when I was invited, uh, it got delayed uh, because uh, Dr. Craig got, uh, was sick for a while. But um, from the beginning, they stipulated that it should be a dialogue and not a debate. And I'm fine with that. You know, of all people, Dr. Craig knows that a debate takes months of preparation. Right. So I was glad to agree to just an informal dialogue. Yeah. Considering the fact that you debated Michael Brown and Chris Date, and it seemed like it seemed like with the Michael Brown debate, he was uh, making a big point of not himself being a philosopher, being unwilling to engage in philosophy. And Chris Date tried, but it was pretty clear he wasn't trained in philosophy. How was it with uh, with? William Lane Craig and you know maybe just tell us a little bit of the background about the sort of debate you wanted to have with him. Well, honestly it's way more fun to argue with somebody like Bill Craig. Um he has a position. He's basically trying to develop it right in front of you. He's not acting like Joe know-it-all that has it all figured out. Um he's willing to admit difficulties. He understands, in most cases, the force of my points that I'm making. And it's very, very different from talking to, you know, most apologists. There's, it's much more substantial and enjoyable. And um, although having said that, I think he was hearing a lot of my objections for the first time. So he didn't always necessarily feel the full force of them. Um, but what I was trying to do was just a couple of things, you know, we, the format was spend the first half discussing his Trinity theory, or turns out theories. Um, and then the second half is going to be on my view. So about his view, I just wanted to get people to call into question its supposed biblical credentials. You know, it, it's commonly assumed that there's just this really easy kind of baby level argument that you can show how the Bible just clearly implies a Trinity and that it doesn't, it's not right. Those arguments are very hard. They're not easy. Mm -hmm. um, and then I wanted people to question the coherence of his own views. Uh, I, I, I think there's a contradiction at the heart of it, which I think we'll get to about my own view. I just wanted to help people to, you know, even consider the proposition that maybe a Unitarian theology fits the new Testament better. And, uh, you know, make people wonder about that by showing how it fits with certain biblical claims and, again, pointing out aspects of the New Testament that just don't fit a Trinity theory. So like the point I made about John 1, you know, if you think the Father created the world through the Son, that means the Son is not divine in the way the one God is divine. This is a Logos theory approach to creation. The ultimate source of creation will there be the Father. The Trinity needs to have all of them be divine, so they all need to be the ultimate source of reality. And uh, just pointing out things like that, or the, you know, the fact that the worship pattern of the New Testament fits our views better than any Trinity theory, because the Trinity's never worshipped and the Holy Spirit's never worshipped. So I knew going in that one hour is incredibly limiting, right? Mm -hmm. I'm a big mouth. Uh, any professor, you put two professors together. Uh, about something that they've thought about for 20 years. How do you stay to an hour? I mean, an hour, we're just like warming up, you know? Mm -hmm. So I had to be very focused and, um, you know, try to maybe bring back the discussion to where it should be rather than go down seven different avenues that opened up. 
So I, you know, I think it went pretty well in the end. Um, I think it got off a little bit onto just, you know, the deity of Christ, which Dr. Craig kind of thought was a slam dunk issue, which is really, to me, a different discussion than the Trinity. But other than that, like, I was pretty happy with the discussion. Yeah. And he, he brought out a minimalist definition of the Trinity and said that he believes the New Testament teaches the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, and there's only one God. And, uh, you know, when he, when he brought that out, you, you pressed him on a little bit, and then he, he brought out a couple of other seemingly innocuous, non-philosophical words, but to the trained person, super philosophical, the word proper and the word person. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I wonder, what, what do you think about his, yeah, what do you, and soul, what do you think about his approach? Do you think it's biblical? Does it make sense? Um, what were you trying to get at there in your critique? Well, first I have to say I was going in just stone cold. Like that was the first time I ever heard about this minimalist definition of the Trinity. You know, for 20, almost 20 years, he's been out there defending the speculations that are in his book chapter, what's it called? Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview, co-authored with uh, J.P. Moreland. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, occasionally people write in, ask questions uh, on his website, uh, reasonablefaith.org, and he, he'll answer them. He wrote a couple short follow-up pieces. So I thought, okay, that's his Trinity theory. It's what he calls Trinity monotheism. Uh, and then he comes out with something different, like, wow, okay, this is this is surprising. And actually, in the course of the discussion, he distinguishes between three different classes of Trinity theories, I think. And the first kind are creedal, ones that are trying to take into account the teachings of the ecumenical councils. And these, he just, he threw, he throws them under the bus, basically. I mean, he, he implied that they're complicated, they're confusing, they're not actually supported by the Bible. He thinks they contradict what actually is supported by the Bible. Mm -hmm. So like, usually when people say, I'm going to defend the historic Christian doctrine of the Trinity, they mean a creedal compliant theory. That's not what he means. He thinks that's wrong. <laughs> that so was he's a really better, surprising move. He he's just a kind of Protestant. disowned the fourth century in one fell swoop. Yeah, no, he's a better Protestant than a lot of apologists in that he's yeah. willing to go there, right? Um, okay, so then creedal theories, he just isn't going to defend them at all. They're hopeless. He's, he didn't quite put it that bluntly, but that seems to be his view. Uh, and then he's got his own Trinity monotheism, which is a speculative, that's the thing in the book chapter about the soul and the three centers of consciousness and the three uh, cognitive faculties. And he's not quite saying, well, this is, you know, this is the doctrine of the Trinity that everybody's ever always held. He's not saying that. He's saying that if you're saying the Trinity is contradictory, well, what about this? Because this seems coherent to me. Like there's one possible way to interpret it. Mm -hmm. And so I think he would admit that that's unique to him. Yeah, maybe him and a few others. So there's that. Okay. And then there's what you're asking about, which in this, for the first time that I've heard, he called it tripersonal theism, or just a mini minimal uh, biblical Trinitarianism. And uh, it's, it's, again, it's strange. And it, it threw me, I had to try to process it on my feet. It didn't do that great a job. Um, so he, he says, this is the, is only two claims. They're my Warfield uh, antennas go up. Oh boy, two really two claims, uh, <laughs> with twenty subclaims. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like two sentences, or you know, one sentence with two halves, but it's actually a lot more than two claims. Um, I'm going to grind through that, by the way, in a follow up episode. I'm going to parse out how many claims it is and so on. But um, so he says it's that there's one God. That's the one claim, and there are three persons such that each is properly called God. Mm -hmm. properly called okay so many problems so yeah my podcast i'm going to try to steal man the definition and try to fix it for him like well was he really i tried to do this a little bit in the discussion but he wasn't really accepting much help but um you know is there a better way to put this to get at what he's really trying to say it's weird to define a kind of theology and then suddenly be talking about proper uses of a word you know like, isn't the tradition that the three are equally divine? Isn't the tradition that all three are fully divine? Like, is that what we're trying to say? Mm -hmm. The word properly isn't helping. Um, you know, what I said immediately in response is that uh, this definition will just allow uh, Unitarians in, like Clark and Biddle, and or I could say origin as well, mm -hmm. right? So they say there's one God. 
It's the Father, though, not the Trinity. But the definition doesn't say anything about a triune God, right? And then there are three persons, each properly called God. Well, if you look in Origen's commentary on the gospel according to John, he's got this big, long spiel about different uses of the word theos. And he explains in the highest sense, it only applies to the Father. And then in the second highest sense, it only applies to the Logos. And then there are senses lower than that where he thinks it applies to stars, which he thinks are alive. Yep. Um, and to saved humans and angels and things like that. So if you say uh, who's properly called God, well, potentially 10,000 different things are properly called God, 10 million, because it's proper to use an established use of a word. <laughs> okay, but what he meant was something like properly in the sense that I, th I think he was stipulating that um, it means divine in a higher sense than any mere man or angel, mm -hmm. something like that. Sort of a top okay. shelf meaning of God. Yeah. So, I mean, the way you want to help it out immediately is to say that um, what he must mean is that each of the persons of the Trinity is God in the highest sense, or that each is fully divine. Okay. But that can't be right according to his own views, unless he's made a big shift in his own views. Because if you look in his book, he very clearly says that only the Trinity instantiates the divine nature. Only the Trinity is God in the sense that it implies being a God. So hmm. he denies that the persons of the Trinity are divine in the highest sense. There's got to be like the second highest sense. Now, um, now, how on earth are you going to establish this or claim this is obvious in the New Testament, you know, that it's the second highest sense that is being used with respect to the father and son whenever it's used. I don't know. I mean, so I wasn't impressed by him just kind of saying this is obvious. It's not obvious that it's used in the same sense, number one. Um, and it's not obvious that that sense is the sense that he needs, number two, right? A lot of Trinitarians, relative identity Trinitarians, or the ones that accept just the kind of contradictory view that you get from the Trinity shield, they will say that each one just is a, is identical to God, right? That's the highest sense. It's the sense that entails being a God. So, okay. Well, he's making moves. He's, he's making real moves here that to try to make this come out, you know, moves that a lot of Trinitarians would disagree with. Um, so the way he's reasoning, this was very clear. And um, this kind of is, is, the key i think to how he's thinking he, he's got this argument that goes like this first of all in the new testament the father and son are called god in the same sense second and if that same sense of being called god or divine was being identical to god then you'd have the father identical to god and the son also numerically identical to god okay but then the same Things that are identical to the same thing are identical to each other. This would just collapse the father and the son so that they would be identical too. Okay. That's obviously wrong. It's, it's against Trinitarian orthodoxy, but also just there are differences between the father and son. Only the son died. The father didn't die, right? Clearly. So at the same time, you have the son dead and the father alive. So you know they're not one and the same one. They got to be two. Um, okay. So therefore... When the New Testament says that the, the Father or the Son is God or is divine, they must be must be just describing or predicating divinity, uh, saying saying something about them that's qualitative rather than identifying. Okay, so then he's going to resist every passage that we think re obviously reflects the assumption that the Father just is God. Like, no, no, you can't have any of them just being God because. Again, it's used in the same sense. <laughs> so if the father was identical to God, so are the son, but then that collapsed the father and the son. Of course, the whole problem with the argument is premise one. How, how on earth do you show that the new, in the New Testament, the father and son are called God in the same sense? And he just seemed to say, oh, look, it's just obvious it's the same sense. Well, I don't, yeah. I don't think it is. He, he didn't so, make a case for it. He just claimed it. And, yeah. uh, you know, I think statistically, we could easily call that into question. I mean, how many times... Even if you're as charitable as possible, how many times does the New Testament call Jesus God versus how many times does it call the Father God? I mean, 99% to 1% is probably even yeah. more than that. So yeah. if the New Testament is trying to say that Jesus is God in the same sense that the Father is God, um, 
it's just not it's not doing very well at that so i i'm i'm yeah and he i'm he averse had... to criticizing the bible for doing a poor job of teaching theology i think rather <laughs> the theology <laughs> right. needs to change yeah no i mean he got that he seemed to get that wrong right i mean the the right perspective you know such as is in this book uh, jesus is god mm -hmm. is that oh wow jesus being called god is is super rare i mean it happens between zero and eight times right I mean, I'm inclined to think maybe it happens once in yeah. Hebrews, but I could be wrong about that one too. But um, but go with the eight times. I mean, <laughs> the way Craig, Dr. Craig described this was, oh, Jesus has got all over the place. Five New Testament yeah, like every, authors. every other just, page. Just everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Very misleading, right? That's yeah. not the picture you get from a standing back and considering not just the individual trees, but the whole forest. Yeah. Another thought I had, which you didn't get into, is that Craig doesn't really hold an orthodox view of eternal generation, and yes, it seems like that. he has more of a more of a genuine Trinity than most Trinitarians, in the sense that uh, he doesn't like eternal generation because he believes it entails subordinationism, and he's yep. very against subordinationism. So yep. he has a son who is truly eternal, uh, but that designation son, you know, really, there's no reason to call the son a son without mm. any kind of generation, right? So yeah, I uh, guess he would think is functional or something, just somehow yeah. the the three equal of them just decided to divvy up the responsibilities. Yeah, I don't know. You guys didn't get into that. But that's definitely another quirk of Craig, uh, mm -hmm. as far as the Trinity stuff goes. What about his church history gap theory? Uh, he thinks the New Testament authors all believed in the Trinity, but admits that nobody, which you, you emphasize this point a couple of times, and he never challenged you on it, that nobody in the second or third century held to a Trinity theory. And he was just like, yeah, you know, those, those patristic authors, you know, what do they know? I'm just saying, you know, that the Bible teaches it and John believed it and Paul believed it and Matthew believed it. And um, it seems like he also disowned the fourth century. So there's sort of like this gap where... There are no Trinitarians, and then they come out later, but like Craig's uncomfortable with them. They're a little weird. So uh, what do you make of all that? I mean, honestly, my main reaction to it is I give him a lot of credit for intellectual honesty, because as a philosopher who, who can pick up and read, you know, David Hume or John Locke and, and take them seriously, he's, he's able to do that with Justin Martyr and Origen and Tertullian. And the subordinationism is just really flamingly obvious. It's just right there. It's very consistent. Whenever someone challenges them on their monotheistic credentials, basically they just fall back on, well, there's only one God, there's only one Father. There's your yeah. one God right there, which is what a Unitarian says. So uh, now other people uh, with highly sophisticated views who are very learned, they will convince themselves that no, actually, there are, you know, Finnegan, Tuggy, or right, there are no Trinitarians in the Bible, but that's okay. Traditions change and evolve, you know, and the right, same tradition right, yeah. that was not Trinitarian then became Trinitarian. That's just good enough for me that it happened in the fourth century. That doesn't make a lot of sense for a Protestant, right? So Craig is more traditional. He's like, oh, no, I got the Trinity right there in the New Testament. Yeah, he's a hardliner. And then it just fall right? It drops off the face of the earth somehow between like 100 and 350. So it's awkward. bizarre. It's so bizarre. awkward. Yeah. And uh, I mean, here's this crowning doctrine, this like ultimate revelation of God's inner being. And uh, the church just instantly loses it and uh, doesn't recover it. And, and yeah. then when it when, when the church does recover it, it recovers it badly and confusedly True. and yeah. in, in a uh, very contested, contentious manner. Yeah. Yep. And, you know, Trinitarians frequently, I think, fall back on sort of a lazy argument from divine providence. Like, honestly, my friend Bill Hasker, uh, who's also going to be in that Four Ways book, he, he, he is just offended that any Christian could think that God could let the church go wrong on such a central thing. And I'm like, dude, you're an open theist. <laughs> and, <laughs> dude, you're a Protestant. Like, If no Protestants are allowed to make that move. Every Protestant <laughs> thinks that things went terribly wrong. You know, they're worshiping the saints and Mary in the two and three hundreds. Um, and then they, they justify Christian idolatry later on. But um, so, yeah, Craig, um, 
you know, this would be a weird divine providence to have Trinitarianism for maybe less than a hundred years, then it just disappears. And then it comes back badly in 381 around then. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's weird. I mean, honestly, our view is better historically and even providentially. God just lets his people make mistakes, you know, and things slowly go off the rails. You know, that's what happened to the Jews. That's what's happened to the Christians. You know, there are by, exciting renewal opportunities and movements mm -hmm. as time goes on as well that God yeah. works with. Yeah. Hmm. And it's interesting, too, because the way Craig uh, articulated the view is not the way that anybody else in church history articulated it, uh, probably prior to B.B. Warfield. So, you know, this is like worse than dispensationalism. We're, we're like waiting until <laughs> Warfield to uh, to get a full revelation of the simple version of the Trinity, which should have predated everything else, but it, it it didn't, you know. So that to me reeks of anachronism. As somebody who's uh, into church history, let's move on to the biblical case that Craig made. Made he said um, he 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 tried to prove the deity of Christ based on uh, just a few a few texts, almost all in John. John one one, John one fourteen, John one eighteen. So there's three right in the the prologue. Uh, 1 John 5.20 and Titus 2.13. Would you like to comment on any of those any further? Or uh, what, what was your, having thought about it a little bit, what's your takeaway on those? Well, I thought it was a super flimsy case. And I was a little irritated that he was just throwing these texts out there as if these were clear in supporting his position. Because in fact, and, and he well knows that they're all very problematic for different reasons, right? So John 1 is just one of the absolute hardest to interpret passages in the New Testament. So to just to say it's clear there is, is not honest. Um, John 1, 18, like he led with that one, right? The only begotten God. Really? Like it's a textual problem. And some of the best- Almost John all the manuscripts have son instead of God there, right? Yeah, right. So, I mean, there in recent times, there's been a prejudice to go with the most difficult reading, which would be the only begotten God. But why on earth, he doesn't think the son is the only begotten God or the unique God. He thinks the father is. That's what he says. So um, the most recent Greek New Testament uh, by Tyndale House goes with son over God there. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So just to put that out there, you know, really like, and I had actually said at one point in the dialogue that, hey, you know, you can't be building your case on difficult texts. Uh, First John 5.20 and Titus 2.13, you have translation issues. And he knows that. And he knows that people like the evangelical Murray Harris, Jesus is God, takes my side on John 5.20. I just mentioned before the one who is true, and that's the Father. And so he's really mentioning two and not one in the clause in question. It's just that Greek grammar is kind of flexible there. And you can't always just go with the nearest uh, noun as the reference. It's just too rigid a rule. Um, so yeah, I, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe if you are in the evangelical bubble, you just think that there's just killer knockdown arguments about all of these disputed texts, but, you know, frankly, a layman with a study Bible, that's a good, or, or a good commentary just will know that these are all difficult and, and unusual and controversial texts. Um, and one thing that really stood out to me was that Dr. Craig just easily blew off any and all New Testament evidence that the authors thought that Jesus had limits which God could not have, right? He just said, well, of course Jesus is human. Like everybody thinks of that. It's just that he's also divine. Now, with this attitude of just being completely unworried about that, you're just assuming that somehow two natures theory renders all of this consistent. Right. So Jesus, oh, yeah, of course, he can be omni essentially omniscient and yet not know the day or the hour, right? Because he's got two natures. Of course, he can be essentially immortal, but he can still die because he's got two natures. How does this work? Well, nobody knows. But anyway, uh, and he's got his own, he's got his own take on that. That's, you know, for what it's worth, I, I don't think it works. Um, I have a paper submitted to a journal right now in which I try to take apart his uh, his own version of two natures theory, right? So in my view, the, the Chalcedonian tradition is a big, unjustly prestigious failure. 
and that there isn't a version of two natures theory which shows how Jesus can be human and divine and which also fits with the Bible. Right, the obvious way is to uh, is the way that Origen and Tertullian took, which is the two natures are they're both beings, they're both persons. So you got a human person and you got a divine person. Yes, yeah, so it's the divine person that has perfect knowledge and the human person has limited knowledge. It's the human person that dies, it's the divine person that never could die. Well, that's you know, that's plenty consistent, but they just got two Jesuses. It's crazy, right? You mm-hmm. you can have consistency if you just throw out the New Testament. If you go with the New Testament, there's one Jesus. Well, you're back to the problem about how seemingly nothing could be both human and divine. But um, yeah, he just that's just not registering with him. But yeah, you brought up that Jesus died and God's immortal, and he he didn't even respond to that. He just right he just glossed over it. And, and yeah, and this this two right natures along. thing, you, you always have to remember that's not a New Testament solution to the problem, right? Right. There's not a single place where any of the any of these authors gets worried about it and then brings in this sort of theory as a way to smooth it out. So it's 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 imported from a later time. You always have to keep that in mind. And once you realize that, okay, and then you see them attributing limits to the sun. Now are they really just turning around and contradicting themselves in the next verse or the next chapter and saying, "Oh yeah, by the way, he's also divine in the way the one God is divine?" I don't think so, right? You now we have to worry about their consistency and um, seeing if we can make it work out some other way. Yeah, how would you respond to his accusation? He made this a couple of times that your exegesis is strained and extreme and not held by any commentators from Boltman to Ehrman. Well, you know that those comments I think were especially about my views about the gospel according to John and. You know that that gospel has a long history of being misunderstood, and uh, I mean, it's a, it's a nice rhetorical point, right? Even the crazy libs don't don't think uh, that John <laughs> that Jesus is less divine than John. But Boltman, I haven't read as much, but Ehrman, you know, to me, Ehrman is terrible about the gospel according to John. He has this developmental theory that he wants to cram it into, and so he's happy to just say that it it totally contradicts the the synoptics. And to me, he's just like a fundy kid, you know, he's still got that fundamentalist kid inside him that just reads it uh, as a blatantly self-contradictory book. You know, he's like, well, the father and I are one, or he says, I am, you know, okay, but he's less than the father too. So I guess it just doesn't make sense. To me, that's not good interpretation. It's not charitable to John. Um, so yeah, um, now I, I think I did push back effectively this much just that um you know the favorite go-to text the prologue to john doesn't obviously seem consistent with or support any trinity theory and i think what it teaches about creation actually contradicts uh, a trinity doctrine so i just kind of could briefly out my outline my view and uh he just kind of poo-pooed that like oh nobody thinks that you know in my presentation there is actually a lot of scholarly support um for my view but what's odd is a lot of the uh commentators in recent times they can see the obvious influence of wisdom literature on john one and yet they it just bounces right off them that hey you don't need to take this deity of christ this logos theory type reading like they just somehow try to incorporate both of those things they can't let go of the logos theory reading and yet they're like, oh yeah, this this is just like earlier talk about divine wisdom through which God created all things, its personification, and so on. There are some authors that are clearer headed, um, but um, I mean it, about the general point about Unitarian exegesis, you know, you have to remember that Dr. Craig is a member of the Conservative Theology Guild, and that guild has excluded Unitarian Christian perspectives for more than a hundred years. He's not just in that, the theology guild, he's in the evangelical camp. So honestly, I think he was hearing that sort of exegesis of John 1 for the very first time. And I think he was hearing for the very first time my sort of exegesis of the my Lord and my God passage. And, uh, you know, he's like, nobody thinks that. I mean, this is this is a liability of being part of a guild. You don't take seriously anything that the guild doesn't take seriously. 
Right. And this saves you from a lot of stupid crap, honestly, but it also blinds you to what the guild is just prejudiced about or doesn't know about. Yeah. So I think he should be a little bit less quick to scoff. And um, what should make you less quick to scoff is to realize that there were Christians who seem to have taken this view about John in the late 100s, in the 200s, and you have Photinus, bishop of a major city in the mid 300s. Oh, so I guess it's fun. not some just crazy, you know, rationalistic, modernistic sort of thing or some something that has to do with liberal theology. Like maybe it's a terrible mistake, but it's a if it is, it's a terrible mistake that's well motivated in a sense. And so it it needs more than scoffing. It needs to be taken with full seriousness. Worth engaging with. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I guess I, I wish that uh I don't know. It to me it's 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 rhetorically powerful, of course, to say, oh, well, you don't have any commentaries. Um, but at the same time, you know, a true scholar doesn't doesn't recognize popularity of an idea as evidence of its veracity, right? That's that's kind of an amateur mistake. Um, it's like a first move, you know, like when you're first getting into a topic, you want to focus on the plausible positions. Yeah. Yeah. But then sometimes the group is wrong, you know, like yeah. with, if you, if you went with the group in the early reformation, we, we think that you would have been wrong about a lot of things. And Dr. Craig would have to agree with that. Yeah. I, I guess I wish he would look at the reasons behind it. You know, it, it seems like the whole second half of the debate he really wanted to do exegesis. He's like, oh, let's let's just go to scripture. Let's let's quote some proof text. And then it, as soon as you start exegeting, he's just like, oh, nobody ever believes that. You know. <laughs> Meanwhile, his own organizations and their ancestors before them um, have either murdered us who dissented or uh, excluded us. So it's like, well, why do you think we don't have commentaries? Well, <laughs> well, if, we, yeah, if, I, well if I wrote a commentary. <laughs> And submitted it for publication. Who who's going to publish it in yeah. in their circles, right? Yeah, so, yeah. And what what I'm not sure if he knows is that there was a period, you know, roughly from hmm, when maybe uh, sixteen, sometime in the 1600s till sometime in the mid 1800s, when Trinitarians did debate Unitarians and did take them seriously, and you know, frankly, the Unitarians, generally speaking, got the better of it in these debates. Um, but since about the end of the 1800s, it's just considered something not worth debate anymore, which doesn't make sense. Um, the view is not going away. People are coming to this consistently. So yeah, theology, as a philosopher, the theology guild disturbs me because uh, philosophers try to run towards the best arguments they can mm -hmm. for the most extreme positions, right? So like I, I did my dissertation on free will. So, you know, I'm going to read the guy who says there's no free will. I'm going to read the guy that says free will is impossible. Um, I'm not going to like pretend they don't exist and just, yay, I'm going to have fun with my free will buddies, you know, <laughs> um, or personal Maybe if identity, you were you know, afraid though. Personal identity. I think persons exist and they last through time, but I'm going to read the guy who says there aren't any persons or they don't persist through time. There's just time space worms with parts that exist at times like right so when you get to theology like okay so here's there's the trinitarian arguments uh, unitarian arguments oh well you know you're reading a, a textbook in theology by like mcgrath well there were these silly people back in uh there were these rationalists back in the enlightenment and ha ha halfway house to atheism blah 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 it's inevitable inevitable this all just dies no one takes this seriously it's like well, no, it was taken seriously for hundreds of years in the early church and in the early modern era. So why are we afraid to engage with all these arguments now? Because that they like it that way is the answer. If you, well, if you have a strong case, you should trot out the absolute strongest other arguments and just refute them. But that's yeah. not what they do in the theology guild in recent times. I, I honestly, I, mean, I don't want to, accuse William Lane Craig of this, but uh, I think in, in some cases there's there's a great deal of fear um, where they know that we're, we're going to be Martin Luther to their, you know, their Catholicism 
on this issue and we're going to say the scripture says the scripture says the scripture says and they're going to say yeah but my fancy philosophy which works this way um and you have to I look at the whole really, of scripture the whole <laughs> i don't even really understand it i can't really articulate it <laughs> nobody else has either and it's satisfying yeah. everyone's theory has a problem but you have to believe it or else you're going to hell and it's like you know I don't know, man. You know, that doesn't seem to be the way the Bible reads, but uh, it, it is it is a bother that uh, the engagement is so low. And I think that's why this debate is so exciting. You know, this this uh, opportunity to tangle with an A-lister and I and I and I, to be honest, liked the the brevity of it and the, you know, back and forthness as opposed to the, the rigidity of a of a formal debate. Um, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages, but I thought I thought it came across really well. Uh, how would you prefer to frame the discussion if you did have another debate with Dr. Craig? Well, like we mentioned at the end, there's going to be a four views book. Um, I think the first opening salvos of that are due in early 2023. So God willing, maybe that book will be out by the end of 2023. So I will be having that argument. But you know, I would like to have a real knockdown drag out debate with Dr. Craig on the question, uh, you know, the God of the Bible is tripersonal, right? So this would require a lot more than trying out some deity of Christ text. This would show you how you, you'd have to show how you supposedly get from actual New Testament claims to there being a tripersonal God. I don't think he adopted that burden of argument in our discussion. Now, Dr. Craig has a longstanding policy of not debating Christians. And so usually he's just wiping the floor with this and that atheist. And, um, but, you know, maybe he won't count me as a fellow Christian. So maybe he'll be up for it. I don't know. It'd be an interesting way to promote the Four Views book too, right? And uh, I, you know, I would take it seriously. He's a ferocious debater, uh, not because he's aggressive, like, you know, the lowbrow Sam Shamoons of the world. He's fearsome because he knows how to do it. You know, it's not about personality. It's about argument. And I would only get into the ring with him because I think the case is really strong on my side, right? He's, he's a sharp and confident person as you could hear, but he stays on topic. He responds in relevant ways. He's usually quick to see real difficulties. He just flat knows how to argue and he's way more fun to argue with than most apologists. So I would love to do that. Maybe I'll uh, make, you know, Hey, keep this in mind. Think about maybe after the books, how would you consider this and see if he's uh, interested? Very good. Any final thoughts? Um, you know, I'd like to end on a positive note that uh, I I have to commend Dr. Craig for actually trying to give a substantial defense of a tripersonal God theology. So many lesser apologists want to wave their hands and intone mystery as if this somehow helps at all. Or they just gas about threeness and oneness and starting points and stuff. And they just, they don't take the topic seriously. And I think he does, right? He's, he's treating a serious matter seriously, like he should. He's making real costly moves. You know, you try to see what he's doing. Hey, in my view, he's demoted the father from being fully divine. But that's the move I think that's required by the direction he's going. Um, but, you know, that's what I'd rather have rather than a lot of the bull that gets thrown out on this topic by so many other people. Another costly move, you know, he's rejecting the divine processions, like you mentioned, and he's really trying to prioritize scripture over the creeds. It's like, let's set aside the creeds. I'm just going to show you how scripture is Trinitarian. And, uh, yeah, it's just that I, I don't think he's correct. I don't think he's on the right side of the Trinitarian Unitarian divide. But uh, I love to argue with him because I think. Uh, it's clear, it's a clean fight, and it, you know, it brings out a lot of the issues that people need to think about. Yeah. Well, I enjoyed it to, uh, you know, to reiterate what I said before, uh, fitting it in a one hour package, I'm sure, as you already mentioned, was frustrating. <laughs> Because yeah. you can hardly get into anything and then, oh, we got to switch and, and do the other side of it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, people are busy, you know, mm -hmm. and some of these YouTubes that are out there, three, four, five hours, like who's, who in the yep. world's got time for that? And yep. uh, the answer is, well, you know, some people do and, you know, God bless them. But I think fitting it in an hour is, is really uh, palatable to the mm -hmm. average person. And, you know, I just hope that a lot of people doing internet searches and that are part of uh, Dr. Craig 
his his followers and so on that they would stumble across this and be able to hear at least the other side because like you said before this this unitarian view is just not well known um in churches today or even in the academy i mean he he should have had prepared arguments to defeat you and he really didn't you know he 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 sort of meekly offered up really easily uh contested deity of christ text and even if you granted all of them it doesn't prove the trinity at all i mean it's right. not even close so yeah. Yeah. um you know I, I think they could benefit from a lot more engagement as you mentioned as well but uh hey i really appreciate your time today dr tuggy thanks for coming on restitutio and i uh, wish you the best with your work thanks for having me sean keep up the great work <laughs>